welcome to CSI Training. Our mission is to impart the information, techniques, and the confidence you need to successfully apply RBM, reliability-based maintenance, its technologies and products. Thank you for joining the thousands who have recognized and selected CSI Training as the world leader for quality instructional products. This program will unveil the keys to successful diagnosis of rolling element bearing faults, employing spectral and waveform analysis. This is the first of a dynamic two-part series destined to set the standard for rolling element bearing analysis and save millions of dollars in industry downtime. The second program focuses on determining severity, using the same data to answer the question everyone expects a precise answer to. How long will it last? Let's look at some of the physical characteristics of bearings to understand why we see the spectral and waveform patterns that we do. Each of these bearings has individual characteristics due to its own unique physical geometry, which cause specific frequencies to appear in spectral data when a defect is present. These defect frequencies can be calculated individually for the outer race, the inner race, the cage or fundamental train, and the balls or rollers. Let's take a look at how these can be approximated using an actual bearing on a shaft. The defect frequencies are often expressed as a multiple of the turning speed of the shaft. That is, for each revolution of the shaft, how many impacts will be made due to a particular fault? This bearing has been marked so we can visually determine the approximate frequencies. If a defect is at this position on the outer race, we can count how many balls will impact the defect during one revolution of the shaft. One, two, three, four, five, and just a little more. Five interfraction balls impact the outer race with one revolution of the shaft. Notice that it is not exactly five, but five interfraction. This is the key to differentiating between bearing faults and other faults, such as vein pass, which would show up exactly five times for an impeller with five veins. This fractional energy is called non-synchronous energy. That is, it is not a whole number multiple of the shaft turning speed, like 1.0, 2.0, or 3.0 orders. An order is a way of expressing frequency. Actually, there are three ways to express frequency. How often something occurs per minute or CPM, per second or hertz, per shaft revolution or orders. We will focus on orders because that is a direct correlation to shaft speed. The inner race frequency can be approximated in the same way as the outer race frequency. With the reference marks lined up again, we will assume a defect at the mark on the inner race. As the shaft is turned, let's count the number of balls that pass through the inner race defect. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a fraction. We see here that the inner race frequency is also non-synchronous. Notice that the inner race frequency is eight and a fraction, whereas the outer race was five and a fraction. Unless the bearing is a unique thrust design with a 90 degree contact angle, the inner race frequency will always be a higher frequency than the outer race frequency. After lining up our reference marks, the cage frequency can also be approximated by rotating the shaft one full turn. With one complete revolution, we see that the cage went less than halfway around. Cage frequencies usually occur between 0.3 and 0.47 times the shaft turning speed. A defect on a roller will also generate certain discrete frequencies, depending on how many times the roller turns over during one revolution of the shaft. With the reference marks in line again, we rotate the shaft one full turn and this time count the revolutions of the roller. One, two, and a fraction. This roller defect frequency, or ball spin frequency, as it is commonly called, is also non-synchronous energy. In our approximations, we've shown that the ball spin frequency 
the outer race frequency and the inner race frequency are all non-synchronous energy. The cage frequency is some synchronous energy. That is, it rotates less than one time per shaft revolution. Therefore, a subsynchronous frequency is a lower frequency than shaft turning speed and is a fractional order value. The cage frequency will be less than one half or 0.5 times turning speed, usually 0.3 to 0.47 times turning speed, except in that same rare occasion mentioned before, a 90 degree contact angle thrust bearing or in an application where the inner race is stationary. All these frequencies can be determined exactly using FreakCal, the frequency calculation program in CSI's Master Trend software. This screen is the bearing calculation screen for inputting data about the bearing. A report is then generated showing the calculated frequencies for each component of the bearing. After entering the bearing name and number, three other fields are important. The first is the use physical data field. Toggling this to yes, enables us to input the actual physical dimensions of the bearing. Secondly, specify whether the inner race is rotating. The frequencies are not the same in applications that have the outer race rotating. The frequency units can be toggled from hertz to CPM to orders. We want to use orders so we can locate the bearing frequencies for any shaft speed. Four pieces of information are needed for the frequency calculations. They are the number of balls or rollers, the diameter of the ball or roller, the pitch diameter, and the contact angle. The pitch diameter is the measurement across the bearing from the center lines of the balls or rollers. Tapered bearings are measured in the same way, through the center line of the rollers. The contact angle is zero for bearings that do not have any thrust loading, such as this ball bearing. This angular contact ball bearing has a contact angle of 30 degrees. It is measured from the center line of the balls to the center of the curve. It is important to know the exact contact angle because the calculations vary with the angle. The contact angle and the pitch diameter are not readily available in the field. Often, the engineering group of the bearing manufacturer must be contacted for this information. Some manufacturers consider this information proprietary will only give out the calculated frequencies. CSI has compiled a bearing file with nearly 16,000 common bearings that proves to be quite helpful in making an accurate diagnosis. This frequency calculation program can be a standalone product when used with a bearing file to perform the calculations. We are now ready to generate the calculated bearing frequencies. Notice that these frequencies are shown in orders, that is, multiples of turning speed of the shaft. A defective cage or fundamental train will show up at 0.38, which we expected because of the approximations made earlier. The ball spin frequency is 1.98. A defect on the outer race will show up at 4.19, and an inner race defect will show up at 6.81. The outer race and inner race frequencies added together will be a whole number equal to the number of balls or rollers in that bearing. When a manufacturer supplies only the calculated frequencies, CSI recommends always summing these inner and outer race frequency values to make a quick check that the data looks reasonable. Let's take a look at how some of the variables affect the calculated frequencies. If this bearing had been entered at 30 degrees instead of 5 degrees, how would the frequencies be changed? We see that the outer race and inner race frequencies are changed. They may not be much different, but when multiplied four, five, or six times, the difference really shows up. Later, we will see why this is so important to us. Some machines have a bearing which is entirely for thrust. These have a contact angle of 90 degrees and are sometimes referred to as pancake bearings. We'll use the same bearing information, but change the contact angle to see the effect on the calculated frequencies. We see that the inner and outer race frequencies are the same which we would expect since the races are the same. Notice that they still sum to equal the number of rolling elements. One question often asked is, when entering data for double row bearings, do you use the total number of rolling elements or just the number per row? Let's take a look at this double row bearing and determine the answer. If there is a chip out of one side of this outer race, 
there will only be one row of rollers passing through the defect. Therefore, the frequency should be calculated based on the number of rolling elements in one row. These frequencies can be determined mathematically by inserting the bearings physical data into some generic equations. The calculation in orders for the outer race frequency is shown here. In the equation, NB is the number of balls, BD is the ball diameter, PD is the pitch diameter, and theta is the contact angle. This is the equation for calculating the inner race. This equation is used to calculate the fundamental train frequency or cage. This final equation is used to determine the ball spin frequency. Remember that these equations give the frequencies and orders exhibited by defects in the individual components. However, it is also important to point out that if a specific bearing ID is not found in the file of nearly 16,000 entries, these formulas are resident in the Freak Cal program of Master Trend to perform the calculations for you. This is a good time to address another common concern. Let's say that upon running a lookup for a particular bearing ID, many entries are located in the bearing file. Often, the entries are listed for various manufacturers, but can also be listed more than once for the same manufacturer. Though most of the bearings listed would be suitable replacements and can fit the shaft, the bearing design and therefore the physical geometry will be different. We have already determined that the physical geometry of the bearing determines the frequencies generated by defects in the various components. So it is important to know which bearing is actually in the machine. Approximations can be made for the race frequencies if the bearing ID and or manufacturer is not known, but the number of rolling elements is known. The outer race is approximately 40% of the number of rolling elements, and the inner race frequency is approximately 60% of the number of rolling elements. Now let's consider bearing faults that can be detected using vibration analysis. Faults can be detected when there are defects on the inner or outer race, the rolling elements, or the cage. Other faults detectable by vibration analysis include looseness in the housing, excessive internal clearances, the bearing turning on the shaft, lack of lubrication, and a misaligned or cocked bearing. In spectral data, we expect to see peaks of some amplitude at one time's turning speed due to unbalance, misalignment, or some amount of looseness. On gearboxes, we expect to see a peak at gear mesh frequency, which is the number of teeth times the turning speed of the shaft. On pumps or fans, we expect to see peaks related to vein pass or blade pass. The presence of these peaks does not necessarily indicate a problem or fault. However, bearing frequencies are defect frequencies, and their mere presence indicates at least an incipient problem and should send a warning to the analyst to pay attention. With a good bearing, these calculated defective component frequencies should not even appear. In a spectrum, it seems reasonable to expect the bearing frequencies to show up at their calculated defect frequencies. For the example bearing, a defective ball or roller would be at 2.4 orders. An outer race defect would be at 5.79 orders and an inner race defect at 8.21 orders. However, these primary defect frequencies may be so low in amplitude that they are not even noticed by the analyst. Instead, it is multiples or harmonics of these defect frequencies that tend to show up first in the high frequency range of the spectrum. Knowing this, we need to be very specific as to how we display spectral data. This spectrum is displayed in velocity which allows us to see this high frequency energy as well as the low frequency of one times and even subharmonics. When this same spectrum is displayed in displacement, all the high frequency energy disappears. It may seem as if the machine is healed, but no mechanical change has occurred. Displacement amplifies the low frequency energy and minimizes the higher frequencies. Displaying the same spectrum in acceleration now amplifies the high frequencies and minimizes the lower frequencies. This can cause you to overreact to this higher frequency data and at the same time ignore problems at one, two, and three times turning speed, which are often the problems that lead to premature bearing wear and failure. 
For this reason, we recommend that you view spectral data in velocity. Choosing not to compromise key root cause failure information at lower frequencies by selecting a velocity spectrum does not deny the value of acceleration data in the enhancement of high frequency bearing defects. In this velocity spectrum from another machine, we can see how difficult it can be to discern a bearing defect because of the low amplitudes associated with these high frequencies. With the same spectrum and acceleration, we can also see why we would not necessarily want to collect the data in acceleration and miss the significant contributions due to the lower frequencies. We need the best of both worlds. Let's look at the time waveform in velocity and acceleration to determine its health in detecting high frequency occurrences. Here we see a simple sinusoidal pattern at a frequency associated with a one times turning speed of the shaft. This velocity waveform is demonstrating significant unbalance on a fan and is very good information. But the velocity spectrum is similar as expected. There is not much energy evident in the spectrum except unbalance. We're not able to change the unit's display of a singular time waveform after it has been collected. Instead, the data must be collected again using a different setup in the analyzer. When we display an acceleration time waveform from the same fan point, we see an underlying sinusoidal pattern. However, notice how significant the high frequency information is displayed. Now we can see a tremendous amount of high frequency data. The imbalance of this shaft is so significant that it is beginning to damage the fan bearings. As we develop the diagnosis for rolling element bearing defects in this program, we will derive tremendous value from acceleration time waveforms. Viewing data in acceleration clearly enhances the high frequencies, which is where the bearing defects occur. For these reasons, we strongly recommend storing the time waveforms in acceleration and the spectral data in velocity. With the Model 2115 machinery analyzer, this is accomplished in the change setup options. Select measurement mode and toggle the signal integration mode to digital. Using this setting along with an accelerometer, the waveform can be stored in G's and the spectrum in velocity. This has the added benefit of viewing both the waveform and spectrum in the proper units while the data is still in the analyzer. First, let's consider several characteristics of outer race defects. This particular spectrum has a lot of high frequency energy that is caused by the outer race of the bearing. Notice that these peaks are out of the high frequency area of the spectrum. The primary or fundamental outer race frequency does not even appear. By marking one of these peaks and using the sideband cursor markers, we can move over to another peak. This change in frequency approximates the calculated outer race frequency, and the sideband cursors mark several of these peaks. The waveform for this spectrum has high energy levels in a repeatable pattern. Because the components are actually impacting each other, the amplitude in acceleration, or G's, is high. Here again, we see that it is important to store the waveform in acceleration, even though the spectrum is stored in velocity. There is incredible impacting with up to 14 G peak-to-peak -peak swing. Note the high levels as the rolling elements impact the defect and then smooth out on undamaged surface. This can be compared to an automobile tire impacting a pothole, coming back out and settling down as the pavement is smooth again. The historical spectral data for the sparing over the previous months looks like this. If we had been banking on the amplitude of the primary outer race frequency to show the severity, this bearing could have failed before an alarm was triggered. The second, third, and even fourth harmonic are negligible in amplitude. If we had collected the spectral data to only 20 times turning speed, we would have missed the bearing defect. Many analysts complain of missing bearings, and one key factor is they do not set the maximum frequency far enough out to see the defects. We need to realize, though, that small bearings with seven or eight rollers will probably begin showing up in frequency data at less than 35 times turning speed. On the other hand, larger bearings with many rollers will tend to show up first at much higher order frequencies. Although the next program in this series deals exclusively with determining severity of defects,
and how long the bearing will last. Here, we will use actual data to briefly and simply illustrate a typical failure progression. This is an important part of addressing severity, which is discussed at length, along with other techniques in the program, on determining the severity of bearing defects. This first set of data from another machine does not indicate any problem with the bearing. The next month's data shows some non-synchronous energy in the higher frequencies. This is probably the early stages of a defect. Data for the third month now shows more non-synchronous energy, and notice that this energy is lower in frequency. The pattern of the waveform data here has often been compared to a school of angelfish. The reason for this pattern is a ball strikes the defect, making an impact, and then rings down. Another ball then strikes the defect and rings down and so on. When a defect first develops, the G level may not be very high, not over a 3 or 4 G swing. As wear eats away at both sides of the defect, it becomes wider and deeper, causing harder impacts. It is possible to see 20 to 40 G swings in severe stages of some bearing applications. Interrace defects can be easily overlooked because of the extremely low amplitudes in spectral data. Let's look at this pump as a typical example. The transducer is placed on the pump, and then we pick up the vibration through it. What we actually pick up is any vibration transmitted through the case. Of course, the strongest vibration will probably be related to any unbalance or misalignment in the shaft. The strongest bearing vibration would tend to be the outer race because it has a more direct path of transmission to the transducer. This inner race will have to transmit its energy through the balls, through the outer race, and then through the casing and to the sensor. This means that the inner race frequencies will probably be much lower in amplitude than the outer race defect frequencies. Standard alarm levels are often set high enough to miss the data altogether. In cases like this, Pattern recognition is very important. We have already determined that inner race defects are calculated to be non-synchronous energy and that they occur at higher frequencies than outer race defects. Another characteristic of inner race defects is that they are often modulated by shaft turning speed. This modulation occurs because the race is directly coupled to the shaft and therefore picks up any source of turning speed vibration. The modulation is displayed in spectral data as sidebands around the inner race defect frequencies. How can we use the phenomena of sidebands to our benefit? Sidebands tell us many things. They are used to pinpoint electrical problems in motors, to assess the condition of gears, as well as the severity of bearing defects. These sidebands are peaks that are evenly spaced about both sides of a frequency. There may be only one sideband or several sidebands on each side. One side may have more than the other. For inner race frequencies, the spacing of the sidebands is normally one time shaft turning speed. This is easy to see when a peak list is generated for the spectrum that has an inner race defect. Here, we can see a harmonic of the defect frequency at 34.4 orders, another peak at 35.4 orders, and another at 36.4. Another family of peaks is shown here being one order apart. These sidebands are all non-synchronous energy. Inner race defect frequencies then can show up as families of non-synchronous peaks. Here is the harmonic of the inner race frequency with sidebands spaced at one times turning speed of the shaft. The analysts call this inner race defect as a cracked inner race. The mechanics changing the bearing said they heard it pop as it was removed and argued that was when it actually cracked. In this case, they both were right. The CSI analysts suggested one of the rows had cracked, but it cracked the rest of the way as it was being removed. He was confident that the spectral and the waveform data indicated a crack. When the bearing was cut apart again, it revealed the story. There is an obvious crack all the way across the bearing. However, only one row has a wear pattern across the crack, as you can see here. Now, why was the analyst so confident of his diagnosis? Yes, a lot of it is his experience. But again, 
Pattern recognition is the key. This spectrum looks similar to some of the other interrace defects we have looked at. It has the families of peaks around the defect frequency spaced at shaft turning speed. But these families are very low in amplitude, often no peaks higher than 0 0.01, and have many sidebands. The waveform will have areas of considerable impacting with smooth areas, and may appear as a school of angelfish with an impact ringing down. The amplitudes may be very low when the crack first develops, maybe 3 to 4 Gs. As both sides wear down, the crack becomes a wide, deep trench creating impacting that may exceed 40 Gs. These impacts will vary in amplitude due to their location relative to the load zone. Since the inner race is typically rotating, the crack or defect continually moves in and out of the load zone. This means that the defect may not even show up when it is not in the load zone. At best, it will be much lower in amplitude. For this reason, we recommend that your sample time in the waveform be long enough to include more than one full revolution of the shaft. It is very important to be able to call a cracked race because a cracked race increases tolerances between the shaft and the bearing and decreases tolerances between the bearing components. The increased tolerance to the shaft causes the bearing to slip on the shaft. This slipping or turning on the shaft eats away at the shaft surface and will cause more damage as looseness develops. As the shaft is worn away, the bearing defects become masked in spectral and waveform data for all the rubbing energy. There have been cases when the shaft has been worn one quarter of an inch and no distinct bearing defect was evident in spectral and waveform data. The decreased tolerance between components causes the bearing to heat up, changing the viscosity of the lubricant and leading to seizure. So with interrace defects, we expect to see non-synchronous peaks at very low amplitude, modulated by families of sidebands, separated by shaft turning speed. The waveform for an interrace defect shows high impacting and then smooth areas as the ball dips into the pothole and rolls on the smooth surface again. It may have the appearance of a school of angelfish, especially in the event of a cracked race, where the impact will tend to ring down. Rolling elements include balls, cylindrical rollers, spherical rollers, and tapered rollers. These all produce defect patterns that are common among them. Like race defects, the calculated defect frequency may not appear, but the harmonics may show up. Data from a paper machine bearing showed a single peak at a little more than 22 times turning speed with amplitude over 2 inches per second. This was exactly five times the ball spin frequency. On inspection, five rollers were flat on one side. This caused the severe amplitudes. When harmonics of ball spin frequencies show up in spectral data, the highest peak is usually equal to the number of defective balls or rollers. In other words, the dominant harmonic of rolling elements tends to be at the number of defective rolling elements times the calculated defect frequency. This is an unusual case of a new bearing on a paper machine that had five defective rollers when it was installed. Most often, however, the ball spin frequency does not show up at all, but instead shows up as sidebands around another frequency. This spectrum has non-synchronous peaks at the outer race frequency, but they have sidebands. A closer look reveals the sidebands are spaced at the ball spin frequency. This commonly indicates defects in both the outer race and the rolling elements. There are cases when the ball spin frequency appears even when there is no visible damage to the balls. This is the case when the cage has failed, such as this rivet location, and causes the balls to be thrust hard against the cage. All these rolling elements can cause specific frequencies in the spectrum when defective, but most commonly show up as sidebands around other component defect frequencies. Typically, if the rolling element is defective, it will transmit a wear pattern to the races, and most often, it is these defective raceways we more visibly see in the data. The distinguishing factor is the spacing of sidebands. The sidebands spaced at the ball spin frequency tend to appear in later stages, while the earlier stages may show a peak at the number of defective balls times the ball spin frequency.
A broken cage can cause the appearance of the ball spin frequency even though the rolling elements are not defective. Even though the rolling elements are not defective. Cages vary in types, styles, and materials, as well as sizes. Thought of as high frequency energy. Most of these bearings have calculated cage defect frequencies that fall between 0.3 and 0.45 times turning speed. This means, of course, that they are subsynchronous energy. Of the four bearing components, none of them has a calculated defect frequency that is synchronous energy. Cages are seldom the first component to fail in a bearing, but are usually aggravated by chips and pieces that come out of the other components and lodge between the cage and the balls. This eventually wears or breaks the cage so that the balls are not held in place as they should be. This spectrum indicates there may be a problem with the cage, yet there is no cage frequency peak in the spectrum. These peaks out here are non-synchronous peaks of outer race harmonics and have sidebands. A close look at a peak reveals sidebands that are spaced at approximately 0.39 orders apart. This is the cage frequency for the bearing and is typical of cage problems. They most commonly appear as sideband spacing around a defect frequency of the races or balls. Multiple defects in a bearing generate multiple frequencies, which then create very busy spectral and waveform data. In spectral data, it is common to see inner and outer race frequencies that may have sidebands of cage or ball spin frequencies. The waveform data may have so much impacting, it appears like the random impacting associated with looseness. Lubrication is a problem that often occurs with rolling element bearings. Either the lack of it, too much of it, or dirty lubrication. Lubrication loss may be due to seal damage, overheating causing change in the lube properties or even too much lubrication, forcing the seals to leak. A dry bearing like this one generates high-frequency noise as the components contact each other. This high-frequency noise is from the excitation of the natural frequencies. Installed bearings have natural frequencies that fall between 500 and 2,000 hertz. As the metal contacts metal, these frequencies are excited and then show up in spectral data. This spectrum is a classic textbook example of inadequate lubrication. Seven peaks are spaced about 93 hertz apart that fall between 800 and 1600 hertz. They are 3.2 orders apart and might be mistaken for outer race defects, but they don't match for this bearing. The wide skirts at the peaks can be attributed to the fact that the natural frequencies vary as the bearing turns causing these non-discrete peaks. Although the highest peak in this spectrum is less than 0.05 inches per second, the overall energy is 0.13 inches per second. All this energy is due to the fact that the broadband noise floor is raised up and includes all the energy in each line of resolution. The waveform does not have any particular pattern, but is very random due to all the frequencies that are being excited. Notice the high G levels. Remember that in most cases, the impacting is considered severe if there is a 2G swing in the waveform. The amplitudes here swing from a plus 6Gs to a minus 4Gs or a total of a 10G swing. Inadequate lubrication has been considered the single most common cause of bearing failure. Without proper lubrication, the bearing heats up and expands, reducing clearances and adding stress to the bearing. Typical spectra data shows three to seven peaks, spaced 80 to 130 hertz apart, in the region from 800 to 1600 hertz. Overheated grease can also become carbonized to the bearing components, and then appear as a defect frequency of that component. One category of bearing problems tends to show up at harmonics of shaft turning speed, these include internal bearing clearances, loose bearing mounts, a bearing loose in the housing, a bearing slipping on the shaft, and a misaligned or cocked bearing. A pillow block bearing with one bolt loose allows one side to rise up and then bang down, causing impacts one or two times per revolution. If both bolts are loose, 
the bearing will rock up and down on both ends, causing impacts two to four times per revolution. A bearing that has loose components, or that has worn so that the clearances have increased like this one has, will show looseness in the spectral data. Since looseness usually appears as harmonics of turning speed, we expect to see a few harmonics of the shaft speed. This spectrum shows many harmonics of shaft speed. This many harmonics indicates severe looseness, but look at the amplitude. For looseness this severe, we expect to see very high amplitudes. Since these amplitudes are very low, it indicates there are probably several loose bearing components. The waveform shows random impacting at a fairly high level. All this impacting is due to the balls rattling around in the housing. From this point, the wear will increase looseness to the point of complete failure. The bearing lasted another four months, but looking at the data, we see the increase in looseness with more amplitude and more harmonics. Notice the final month's data. It appears that it healed itself, for there is no energy over 0 0.03 inches per second. The energy level in the waveform has dropped to a 4G swing, still severe, but much lower than previous readings. This is because the clearances on this inboard bearing have increased so much that the coupling is actually carrying the shaft. When the bearing was replaced, it fell apart with substantial parts of the bearing not accounted for. When a bearing is loose in the housing, it will rub, generating a truncated or non-symmetrical waveform. Rubbing shows up in spectral data as fractional harmonics of turning speed with a one-third times peaks dominant. Operationally, we expect to see variations in speed. Logically, we expect excitation of resonance frequencies from the impacting components. A spectrum that appears to be looseness can actually be much more severe. This is the case of a bearing slipping on the shaft. This may generate many harmonics of running speed at very low amplitude. When a bearing slips on the shaft like this one has, extreme amounts of heat are generated, which eventually causes the shaft to be eaten away. Oftentimes, in this case, a three times peak is the predominant spectral energy. A bearing that is improperly mounted and is cocked on the shaft puts unusual axial loads on the bearing and forces the rolling elements against the races and cage. The loading itself is a major contributor to premature bearing failure and is discussed in the next section. The force due to loading causes frequencies to be generated by the balls or rollers, which usually show up at the number of rolling elements in the bearing times the shaft speed. A test that can confirm a misaligned bearing is to acquire phase readings on the axial end of the bearing in the four compass positions. Readings from one side to the other would be approximately 180 degrees out of phase. The phase difference in the top to bottom readings would be about 180 degrees out also. Very few bearings live a long, good, healthy life. In fact, studies have shown that only 9% of all bearings reach their projected in-service age. The primary cause of failure is improper lubrication. When too much grease is applied, the seals are forced open and allows the lubricant to escape as it heats up. One bearing manufacturer suggests that more bearings are destroyed because of over-lubrication rather than under-lubrication. When recommended lubrication intervals are not met, the bearing lubricant can change viscosity and cause the bearing to overheat and begin metal-to-metal -metal contact, which accelerates the failure of the components. Whether the lubricant is grease or oil, there must be adequate lubrication. The second most common cause of premature bearing failure is improper mounting and mounting techniques. A bearing is a precision component of equipment and as such must be installed with care using precision techniques. Other causes of bearing failure include improper application, manufacturing defects, and brunelling. Brunelling is damage done to the bearing while it is not turning. This occurs during transportation, handling, installation, or even while sitting on the shelf waiting for use. For this reason, standby equipment should be rotated on a periodic basis. It is necessary to rotate large bearings from time to time and store them laying down to protect the bearings from brunelling. Brunelling results from the impacting of the rolling elements on the raceways while it is not turning 
the races have marks at the spacing of the balls or rollers and are actually small indentations. Under magnification, these dents still show the grinding marks which have not been disturbed. When a Brunel bearing is used, it begins its service life with deficiencies. The Brunelling causes higher initial vibration and more rapid deterioration as the metal begins to separate at the Brunelling locations. Another factor in the life of a bearing is the load on the bearing. The equation used to calculate bearing life has a cubed effect with respect to the load. As an example, a rotor with a 44-inch diameter fan weighs 1,000 pounds and turns at 2,220 RPM. The rated bearing capacity is 20,000 pounds. The calculated bearing life is about 60,000 hours. If the fan has one ounce of unbalance out on the edge of the fan, it will have 22 ounce inches of unbalance. We can calculate the additional load of this one ounce of unbalance due to centrifugal force. The equation can be simplified to the constant 0.00639 times the unbalance in ounce inches times the square of the speed in hertz. Plugging in our numbers, 22 ounce inches of unbalance times 37 hertz squared gives us the result of 192 pounds. This means that, due to centrifugal force, a one ounce weight, 22 inches from the center of this rotor, adds an effective weight of 192 pounds to the rotor. This is nearly 20% of the actual rotor weight. In the bearing life formula, when we add this weight to the rotor weight and run the equation again, the result is about 35,000 hours. The life loss due to the one ounce of unbalance is 25,000 hours, which is 42% of the original life. From this example, we see how unbalance affects bearing life. The levels of vibration affect bearing life in much the same way. Assuming an overall level of 0.2 inches per second is normal vibration yielding a 100% bearing life, then increasing the overall vibration to 0.6 inches per second yields only 31% or less than one-third of the normal bearing life. To extend bearing life, it is imperative to pay attention to the peaks in the lower frequency range of the spectrum, which are commonly the root cause of the bearing degradation, such as misalignment or unbalance. Remember that our earlier discussion on viewing data pointed out the benefits of displaying spectral data in velocity with the specific goal of seeing these low frequency peaks as well as high frequencies. This spectrum has peaks that are indicative of bearing problems. Let's look at the setup required to collect data that ideally maximizes your ability to capture bearing degradation. The maximum frequency should be set depending on the bearing and the speed which it is turning. Race defects will show up in the higher frequencies first and could be as high as the number of rolling elements times the calculated race defect frequency. This small bearing has eight balls and has an inner race frequency of about five orders of turning speed. This means that defects could reasonably appear as high as 40 times turning speed. This bearing, on the other hand, has 19 rollers in it. The calculated inner race frequency is about 11 orders of turning speed. 19 rollers times the inner race frequency is 209 times turning speed. Again, realize that these are idealized for the bearings only. No other considerations have been made. Practically speaking, both of these would probably be modified. If the small bearing were in a motor, then rotor bar problems would be missed if the maximum frequency were only to 40 orders. If the large bearing is turning very slowly, we may be interested in multiples of gear mesh that may be outside this range. When shaft speeds are above 15 hertz, defects can be found when the resolution is only 3 to 5 hertz per line. For bearing speeds below 15 hertz, the resolution should be 1 and a half to 3 hertz per line. A general purpose maximum frequency that is a good compromise for garden variety equipment without gears such as pumps, motors, fans, etc is 65 times the turning speed with 800 lines of resolution. The spectrum can be divided into six separate bands or parameters. These bands can each have its unique alarm levels. For these rolling element bearings, CSI recommends five spectral bands plus one variable high frequency band.
The first spectral band should include the subharmonics and the one times energy. Typically, set the cutoff at 1.5 orders. The second spectral band includes the energy at two orders, so its upper limit is 2.5 orders. A band set from two and a half to eight and a half orders covers looseness and vein pass. The next two bands are bearing bands. The first bearing band spans from eight and a half to 35 and a half orders. The second bearing band spans from 35 and a half to 65 orders. The sixth band, as mentioned earlier, is used for the variable high frequency band from one to 20 kilohertz. This last band is in acceleration and is outside the parameters of the stored spectral data and is only a trended value. Again, realize that these recommendations are for normal garden variety pumps, motors, fans, and so on. Special applications such as high turning speeds, above 100 hertz, or extremely slow turning speeds may require special settings. Explanation of these bands and recommended alarm levels for each band are covered in the program Rolling Element Bearings, Severity Determination. While many areas have been covered, we've only highlighted the most common problems and characteristics. We realize that unique design and applications may cause you to see other characteristics in spectral and waveform data. Thank you for joining the thousands who have recognized CSI training as leading industry with quality information, instruction, and application of PDM and RBM techniques. We are confident that the application of these tips and techniques will help you succeed in your analysis of rolling element bearings. We look forward to assisting you achieve success in your future endeavors. CSI, changing the way the world performs maintenance.